Candidates, please welcome conservative commentator and journalist Mary Catherine Hamm. Yay. And Democratic strategist and a CNN political analyst, Hillary Rosen. And Steve is right here to lead the conversation. Thank you. Hi there. Mm -hmm. How are you? So, you heard about all the kind of love and goodwill in the last panel, and, and uh, there wasn't any, any uh, difference I could get between the two of them on virtually anything. I don't know if I'll do better here. Um, let me start with you, Mary Catherine. You know, in thinking about the, the broad agenda, and I, I really, in, the, in this panel, want to get into part of what uh, candidate Trump and candidate Clinton are putting on the table. How do you look at the, both the priority and the execution of early childhood programs as you see them today? Be your best conservative critic on what's <laughs> not going right. Yeah, I think it's fine to say, look, everyone's in, there, many people in polling are in basic agreement that this is an important thing and that investment is good, right? Mm -hmm. The question then You becomes, acknowledge that. that right, the question then becomes, right. how is that investment spent uh -huh. and how do you measure whether it's working? Mm -hmm. Because uh, as a conservative critic of something like, for instance, Head Start, which has been the federal government's attempt to do pre-K pre early education for many years is what well, we're spending billions of dollars and we're not getting a ton of progress out of it. Uh, and this is according to HHS studies that have happened several times over that by third grade when you track these, these kids that they've lost most of the gains they may have gotten at the beginning. So that, that money being spent, although it's an investment and everybody agrees, many people agree that this is an investment we should be making, it is not a stand-in for actually doing the job. And you don't get to pat yourself on the back for it if you're spending that money and not getting the results. So that's were you, my, were you, my main concern. Were you is, surprised by this factoid that Oklahoma has one of the best uh, early childhood programs in, in the country? Well, yeah, and I'm and, and what not, do you think they're not doing surprised, to get it right? but, I, but I think that is part of what my priority as a conservative would be also, which is to say, and I was glad to hear both uh, the gentlemen on the stage, by the way, I think it's totally cool for men to care about this too, uh, <laughs> that both of the men on the stage emphasized having some local control mm -hmm. and allowing those districts to make those decisions because I think those are the more effective programs when the people close to the, the community are able to make those decisions. And that is sort of the trick with a federally pushed program mm -hmm. is allowing the kind of flexibility, nimbleness, uh, and, and tailoring to local problems that you need in this situation. So those would be my, I think, the two concerns for me when you're looking at a broad federal agenda for this. Hillary, if you were to tweak our national priorities and the investment side in early childhood program, you know, say we move from an Obama administration to a Hillary Clinton administration, what do you think needs to be done to, to, to change the game, to improve the game on early childhood? Um, I have no idea. Um, but as a, as a policy matter, as a, pro mm. as a program matter, I should say, I have no idea. But I do believe in the studies, and there, there's, there's not an, uh, there are few areas that have actually been studied as much as this. Mm -hmm. um, and the data is just clear, I mean, that they do work, that investment here does matter. Um, so as a, as a top uh, line answer, the, the issue has to be intent, right? It has to be resources and intention. And you know, a criticism of Head Start that, you know, by the time somebody's in third grade, it falls off, isn't a criticism of Head Start. It's a criticism of elementary education and resources at, a, at the next level for kids. So um, the, the, that, so, you know, cutting back on uh, early childhood resources because we can't sustain it is not the answer. The answer is we have to sustain it all the way through. Um, I do think just as a, as a practical matter and to kind of inject some politics into this, that much of this falls at sort of a priority level. Mm. Um, and when you think about Hillary Clinton and her uh, career and, you know, the fact that she had a policy in this area back in June of 2015, Donald Trump still doesn't have one. Um, it just gives you some measure, Bernie, you know, Bernie Sanders actually didn't have one. It gives you some measure of where this rises she on the priority list. She wants universal preschool access paid for, provided universally. Um, what 
I, I guess I, you know, along this. But it's, perhaps, it's not yeah. only that, right? What's it's, that? It's, yeah. it's it's a combination mm -hmm. of things, right? There's an, more investment in Head Start. There's things like recognizing that a lot of young parents are still in college and childcare expenses in college, daycare centers on college campuses where you can share both the intellectual capacity that exists on college campuses as well as help young right. pa student parents. Um, so I, I think that looking at this pretty holistically for how people are really living is important. Mary Catherine, on the GOP side in, in terms of what Donald Trump has put on the table, to the best I can tell, most most of yes, his. Yes, Mary Catherine, defend Donald Trump yeah, like you do every day. <laughs> mo mo most of his approach. She doesn't. Seems to me. <laughs> ever yeah, defend yeah. him? Uh, seems to me <laughs> to be we more, love her for. more on the question of maternity leave and things. I haven't right. I haven't seen much from Trump on education, childhood education. Right. Uh, am I wrong? Uh, no, I, I think in, an, in attempting to be fair to Trump, which is a, what I attempt to be, uh, you know, he does not have a deep policy background. Uh, and I think that, I think that... Fits in 140 characters or less. <laughs> and that, but when you, and you see this campaign that is not a traditional campaign, it does not have the, the right. traditional setup and all the policy papers sure. uh, at the ready. So you will see a dearth of details in many yeah. of these areas. And that's what I've pointed out throughout the campaign. So it's, but that is what makes it difficult to know where he would land. The other, mm. the other interesting thing about his, him is he's not an ideologue. So right. he would hear more investment in Head Start, and because he had never read an HHS study or had no sort of ideological uh, decision-making process that I do about, well, is this effective, and how are we doing this? He'd be like, yeah, it sounds all right to me. Like, <laughs> he's, not, he's not driven by the same things that I am, um, and he has not looked into these things in great detail. And he often just says, oh, my gut tells me that, that pre-K sounds good. Let's... You, you could end up with the same Clinton plan, and he'd be like, yeah, sure, I like that. I mean, it, it really, like, his decision-making process is, is bizarre in that way, and it's very hard to mm. predict. Um, the other thing I would say, I think is a better predictor, perhaps, of where a Trump candidacy or presidency might end up on this issue, is that Pence actually, Mike Pence, uh, drove the fight to fund a pre-K program in Indiana. It was the first time uh, that pre-K programs were given state money. Uh, and it was a combination of some private grants and there was a choice element involved. There was a parental involvement requirement for kids who got uh, this money. And so I think that sort of blends the local mm -hmm. part with some you know, top-down money, with some incentives that blends a sort of conservative-ish policy look on a pre-K program. And I think that might be the thing that, because Pence has talked about policy and has thought about policy, he might be the one who would drive Mm -hmm. That for Trump. That would be my guess, but yours might be as good as mine. I, I you know, I don't know this arena uh, as as well as I know some others, but I'm I'm sort of haunted by this data point that I know from the College Board that has um, at the at the higher education, higher testing performance after kids have come out are tested in high school and and you know are thinking about uh, a potential college. There are about 300,000 people they identify who show extraordinary promise who are incredibly resource constrained environments um, who might not get on a college track or an advancement track because of where they sit economically or something like this. And they said, you know, they look at part of their job as trying to figure out how, given big data, you can identify where these people are and try to get them on track. And, and, and so what they're saying is that there are access problems there. And I'm interested, if you, if you were to, to take that data, and I don't know if it exists, I don't know if we're testing children. I don't know if it's appropriate to test four-year-olds like this. But, but you know, my, my question is, when you think about educational infrastructure and providing fair, equitable access that begins to deal with many of the divides in our society, I mean, just, just as a conversation point, what do you think? Are, are we there that? Do we have a literacy there? Is there awareness of, a, of that challenge? Because when I go around the country, it seems like we're not there. And I'm, you know, again, if, if I'm wrong, let me know. But, uh, is a, is a four-year-old in New York, or apparently four-year-old in Oklahoma, uh, is in pretty good shape as, as say, compared to Wyoming or uh, Alabama. I mean, what, what is your sense of the infrastructure needs at that level and the kind of awareness of that challenge? Well, I think I'm not an expert on every state's issues with this, but I do think there is a, there is a tension here with the question of testing and identifying and big data, which is this. I think, you know, with good intentions, uh, we have put in a lot of testing 
in the K through 12 level, and it's something that also unites both sides in hating it. Mm. Uh, so that's one of the interesting things about the education policy right. area is that people are often united in hating whatever is going on at the moment, often the, the most sort of trendy uh, thing going on. So testing is a double-edged sword where you really do want this information. And that one of the things that concerns me mm -hmm. about a universal federal pre-K program is that if you don't think once you put three-year-olds in a pipeline that's going to end up in the K through 12 testing program, that teachers of three to five-year-olds start getting like, oh, well, are they there yet? Are they there yet? Are they there yet? And then we discard all of the new research that says actually playing is what's best for these kids learning, not the testing model. So I think there's a real tension there, and I think there's a danger of putting these kids in that pipeline early and people getting real rot about whether at three they're making their marks. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure how you prevent that. Right, Hillary? There's so much to unpack there. Um, but how about I'll, it? I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the big picture question though, which is there's absolutely no question that um, resources, uh, class and uh, socioeconomic class and race have everything to do with a child's opportunity in today's America. There's just, it, there's too many studies to ignore. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when you couple that with um, infrastructure on a state-by-state -state basis, you know, where someone's growing up is the sort of the layer on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it, it would be nice if there were uh, investments on a state-by-state -state basis. It would be nice if um, uh, the federal government had some consistent way to help those states that won't invest their own resources. You know, one of the problems you have with complete local control is what we're seeing in, you know, just the Medicaid space, right? Governors are refusing to give their um, poor families Medicaid access, uh, even though the federal government is willing to pay well, they're uh, willing significant to pay for poor share of it. So, um, you know, too much local control is a problem, I think, particularly when it comes to poor people. We've seen it time and time again. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of kind of the the uh, what works and what, what doesn't work. I'm, I'm all for local control and experimentation and demo programs and, and the like. I don't think that we should kid ourselves that investing more in um, early childhood development means that kids are gonna be learning calculus at four years old. I, I think it is a combination of motor skills and, and brain skill development. I, I do think there's a lot of expertise in the field. Now, Hillary, as I understand it, there's, there's sort of a, a, a funding gap that, that you've got, and what the, what the first five years fund has shown is there's extraordinary bipartisan support that these programs can matter, that they are, are important, but as I understand it, that there is, uh, it's still, like many things, a resource challenge, and that you've got a lot of state resources, but there's a gap that, that, that there's an expectation at the federal level. Do you do you because you you're close to the to the Hillary camp? Do you think that in the various programs they have, what they're putting on the table is enough to to do that to to address that gap? And do you think it can be done in a way that maintains a bipartisan consensus, or do you think by the nature of a potential Hillary administration, this bipartisan moment gets divided? You know, I'm going to call an audible on this bipartisan thing. Okay, go ahead. Um, I know this group strives to be bipartisan, but if there was as much consensus on the Hill as these two had, this wouldn't even need to be a forum, hmm. right? It would be happening. The fact is Republicans have defunded these programs. They're not willing to invest in them. Donald Trump put out a child care program last week, which I don't think goes far enough and does the right thing, but put it before the Republican Congress today and it will fail. As minimal as that program is, hmm. So um, I do think that this is about uh, consensus, investment, working together, um, and, and I don't think there's been enough Republican action at the table. Mary Catherine, if you put Donald Trump, that's an interesting point, if you put Donald Trump's proposal in, in front of the Republican Congress today, would it, would it fail? Well, I think if you, <clears throat> frankly, if you put Donald Trump's proposal or Hillary's in front of many voters, it's mm -hmm. not gonna do well, which is why it doesn't do well in Congress. Like people say, oh yeah, this, this sounds like a nice idea, but again, we go to the actual results. It is not enough to spend $180 billion over the years that we've spent 
on Head Start and then blame it on third grade teachers that it didn't work. Well, it's not enough. You owe it to especially low income children who do not have the opportunities that others have to make sure you are spending a lot of money on a program that works. There is always going to be a discussion about that, but the fact about what is the thing that works. Mm -hmm. But the fact that over the years, the government itself has studied this and it is still used as a cudgel to say, ha ha, Republicans do not care you about- You know what, we not, haven't, oh, no, 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 we, haven't we haven't tackled ISIS yet, but that doesn't mean, oh, well, it's not working, so let's defund the military. It's, but not, it's that, not about defunding. That argument it's, just doesn't fly. It's, it's about when, you, when Head Start specifically, when you have this actual information about how it's not working, on that program, when people stand up and say, you cannot do anything to alter this program because it means you hate poor children, that is an ineffective way of doing policy. And that is unfortunately I, I the answer you get on the Hill. Say. And I think it, is, it should be everybody's duty to be open-minded about these programs and to be responsible for the results that come out of them. And I think the skepticism about the federal government's ability to do some of this comes from somewhere. It's not made up. It so, comes from the so fact that people what you're are raising is an interesting no. question the about, about in the lives. broad. The skepticism you know, too often comes from whether or not this is an appropriate investment for the federal government to make, mm -hmm. not whether this works or has opportunity. If if well, if, we will if, have the, to if, on if, that. if you came to the table and said, motives, "Here's 180 a billion dollars, spend it this way," because that would be more effective, then that argument would have credibility. But you don't. But but they don't do that. Actually, you often see that on the Hill, and Democrats no. well, once one again of, one say of the you other debates in the education space where this is playing out an interesting way is, is this uh, ESSA program, Every Student Succeeds Act. And we had this remarkable thing where Randy Weingarten and Lamar Alexander were on the same side of a battle, basically saying that the Department of Education, I have a friend in the Department of Education over here, but in their view was, was uh, not implementing um, this this legislation that had passed and been signed in the way to do it, which basically moves dollars that has a formula for dollars in terms of enhancing programs in a way, and saw uh, DOE doing so. So I I I I, th I can see you know to a certain degree in another category of education where efficacy and how it works is a contentious issue, and there's and you've got people on the right and the left um, uh, who see that. So I guess my question to you is, when we move to the early childhood realm, you're saying these programs don't work and th thus we can't really proceed with other things until we kind of unpack well, no, that. What is I, that what, what you're I'm saying? What I'm saying is that when this has been your giant pilot program, right? it's not really a pilot program, it's much more expensive than that, but when this has been your program and you're not showing great results, do not be surprised when people question your decision to expand it to everyone. That, I mean, that seems like a basic thing to me. And I think some of the dysfunction in Washington and in Congress is one of the reasons that people would prefer to see local control because so they you, know so that that can work I, a little. You know, I'll just answer that by saying, the line? I, there, I'm sure there's somebody in the audience that can refute that Head Start doesn't work. So you can pick I'm data just, points I'm, that work. I'm just waiting, largely. like I'm waiting for yeah. somebody to do that. I'm not smart enough to be able to do that, but I, I don't think we can take it as a given. The point you're making. And so, um, again, it's, it's, a, it it's a question of sort of, ha if you have an alternative way to accomplish it, then the money goes on the table. What I find um, frustrating per from the conservative side, and particularly the GOP side, less the conservative thought leader mm -hmm. side, um, is um, this notion of let's spend it through the tax code. Right as if that's not real spending, as if that's not real dollars, as opposed to so that you're depending on people who have higher incomes who have tax liabilities and the like to figure out to, um, how they can um, uh, do that spending instead of direct spending. But that's still government spending. Mm -hmm. So, Let me open the audience. Do we have a Head Start expert? Uh, we have a Department of Education man it's being very quiet up here. But uh, right here in the very back, yeah. Hi, my name is Piper Davis. I'm with Educare of Washington, D.C., which is part of a national network of uh, 21 Educare schools around the country, which are all Head Start programs. I cannot claim to be an expert. I know someone here is more expert than I on that. But I can say Much that... humility in this room. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> what I can say no. that, no. Of, <laughs> of that I think this argument about Head Start has become heavily politicized and that the way that people, when they say Head Start doesn't work, the two biggest factors that I think get muddied about it are one, that you're measuring based on these test testing mechanisms, which right. we all 
know are problematic, and you're also getting muddied in that, the fact that a child's been in potentially a failing public K through third grade, fourth grade, pick your mm -hmm. age range system. The other piece of it that's, I think, even more important and leads to the question that I do want to ask mm -hmm. is um, the impact of Head Start has shown to be really critical related to social emotional development and child self-regulation. Mm -hmm. When you look at the longitudinal studies, peri preschool and abecedarian, those programs showed that the results that were positive for the participants were related to life skills that allowed them to navigate the complicated world of poverty that they were in, mm -hmm. which were much more important than what kind of reading or math grade you had in the third grade. So those are the reasons that longitudinally those people had lower risk of diabetes, lower smoking, lower um, risky behaviors, fewer rates of incarceration, higher high school graduation, all those kind of things. So Hillary? that's what I know, I'm not an expert, yeah. but I do have a question too. If I, okay. um, my question is we haven't talked, um, the, the momentum on the pre-K side I think is very exciting and positive and interesting and good in this country, but Neither panel has talked about infants and toddlers, the zero to three range, age range, which is where these social emotional um, factors have come, um, are, are developed, especially for children in high poverty situations. And I'd love to hear from the panelists your thoughts about what we can do to make a stronger push for investing in our youngest and most vulnerable high poverty kids. Do you, does the first five years fund deal well, with the first yeah. three years? <laughs> well, I have, well, you have a toddler. I don't know the answer. I'm asking this very innocent to, question. So, I have, so, I have a nine-month-old yeah. and a three-year-old, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, so I Mary talk Kay to is, them oh, often. Okay, I don't talk about uh, <laughs> uh, but, but thoughts on, on I mean, I, I, our conversation today was a bit around um, work on, on, on the infrastructure around four-year-olds, because that's where I took it. But, but on the broader picture, Hillary, do you, have, do you have thoughts on what we ought to be doing in, in terms of the earlier child? I mean, I just don't know. Again, I, I think there's more expertise in here, and, and um, Mary Catherine's kids are much younger than mine, so I don't even have parental <laughs> expertise anymore. Uh. Um, the, the, um, but but I, I do think that, for, for me at least, it, this gets into the child care conversation, and um, having responsible investment and mm -hmm. um, thoughtful policy around child care and um, daycare services that, that I think uh, really has reached kind of crisis proportion for families um, who you know, need it desperately to, to survive. I mean, I have to say I'm fascinated by what you basically said about poverty situations because when I, you know, in the many forums I've had the privilege to, to moderate, one of the things I've learned is it's easy to talk about certain highly resourced environments and what may be possible. But when you look at, you know, what can you re what models can you replicate, um, what can you uh, scale, and how do you make them affordable across a lot of environments and and have that, which I think many of us are trying to sort of look at, sort of thinking about, you know, there's an, a sort of an experimentation development part. But you know, I think about you know parts of Baltimore that are just, you know, pretty miserable. How do you how do you change the life direction? And you know, one can hope that maybe early childhood programs intervention help give you a, a leapfrog out of some of that. I don't know, but I mean, I sort of sense that that's part of what today's discussion might be uh, trying to inspire and get into. Yes, uh, right here in the middle. Gentleman with the tie, I'm so sorry you're in a tie. But uh, yeah. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Hope you, are, you a, are you a Head Start expert? No, I'm not a Head, well, I'm not a head Start expert, but I, I think um, this woman over here made a very good case and, and your point about- And tell about us who you are. My name is Danny Weiss, and I work for Common Sense Media and Common Sense Kids Action, and I worked on the Hill for a long time. Thanks and for joining us. The point I was going to make was about the funding fights, which we've all, everyone right. in this room and others have experienced for many, many years. And just one small example, which some people here have heard me um, say before, is it's commonly stated by uh, conservatives or Republicans, we need to reform programs, combine programs, and it's not about the money and when it comes to uh, domestic policy, education in kids. No Child Left Behind is one example to look at. It's obviously most people's least favorite law in the world, and now it's no longer exists, and so now it's called ESSA. But at the time, you had bipartisan work to change the um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and the deal with President Bush was We'll deliver, Democrats will deliver reforms, they'll get people to go along with reforms, and you guys right. have to come up and deliver the money. And everyone's like, this is good, everyone's gonna have to make compromises, 
big ideological compromises. It was very difficult. People thought it was the right thing to do, and there was going to be a significant investment in K-12 as a result for poor kids. First year funding increased, got a nice big bump up. After that, deal was over. Deal was broken. Mm. So even when people, you know, I think, believe you made this point, we've got to look at the programs. Are they working? Got to combine programs. Congressman Carter made this point. And then even still in that case, the deal was broken and more money for the military, more money for oil companies and less money for kids. So this cycle sort of has to be broken. It can't just, you, when you look at kids' programs, we all know this. Yes, of course, efficiency. Yes, of course, you know, uh, pro, you have to look at the impacts of programs. But you cannot say it is not about money. You just but, can't but, say but, it. But it doesn't opposite, work that way. The opposite yeah. is also true. Mm -hmm. Money is not success. You see it in district after district after district where no doubt some of these gains that Head Start originally gave children are lost, according to Hillary. They don't perform. There's a reason. And here's the thing. When you're pitching this to voters, you have to deal with their skepticism. So it let me ask you both. I mean, I think this is a very interesting, interesting question. And, and when it comes to policy issues, and what we are seeing today is a world where a spike of interest can matter, and then it's hard to sustain interest. But we're going to have a transition uh, in leadership in this town. We're going to have a moment. Early childhood programs are going to be on the table. Um, and. I guess my, my question to both of you as strategists, if you were to advise those that uh, wanted to develop sustained support and interest that was bipartisan and try to do that, what would be some of the features that you'd put on the table um, to deal with some of the realities that you just said, but to create a sustained uh, interest and support that might last more than a year or more than a deal? Um, Hillary, do you have thoughts on this? Um, I was just... Uh last night with the Washington Post uh, editorial board who told me that I'd sounded downright Pollyanna-ish, which um, no one has ever really accused yeah, me of <laughs> sounding, because I said I thought that uh, when Hillary Clinton is president, the majority of Washington has not been for Donald Trump. Mm. And so the majority of Republicans in Washington aren't going to feel the loss, as it were. Mm. They're not going to feel defeated. Um, and so. The, that lack of vitriol had the potential for um, some bipartisan uh, activity, maybe particularly in the House um, with, the, with uh, Speaker Ryan. We'll have to see what happens in the Senate, whether the Democrats take the Senate. Mitch McConnell may not be so happy if that happens. Um, but I, I guess in, in part, what I would do is use the fact that really for the first time I can remember, um, a Republican presidential candidate has made, tried to make, as flawed as it is, a big deal out of putting forth a child care proposal on the table. And I guess I would use that as an opportunity to try and um, go to uh, you know, a bipartisan group of people and say, look, they're there is a consensus that we have to in, in, figure out how to invest in families and, and this age group and how do we, how do we best do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I would sort of use the folks that Trump has gotten to over the course of the last month on this who have never really even talked about this issue, much less supported anything on it. Mary Catherine? How would, what would you do as a strategist to Look, I, I get think, sustained interest? I, mean, I know I sound like a broken record, but it, it is a hard truth that there is, during this election especially, you have seen a huge segment of voters say, we don't trust any of you people in this town to do any of these things correctly. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a, many good reasons for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it is not, that doesn't cut across clean partisan lines either. There's like the, a pox on both your houses, again, with good reason. So I think coming to people with a pitch for a large federal program is going to have to meet up with that and give mm -hmm. people reason uh, not to doubt because they've seen something like No Child Left Behind and they weren't particularly on either side, but they see it doesn't serve their kid. Um, because they see studies of federal education programs and statistically insignificant gains is the theme of them, and they just don't see them working for their kids. And when, they, when you have that as the ingrained issue, and a great distrust of this town, you're gonna to run up against that. And so making an argument that cuts through that requires dealing with efficacy. It requires dealing with results in order to earn back some of that trust. I agree with that. I wanna to go to our friend from the Hamilton Project. She had a quick intervention. 
know, we, we just tw we just tweeted it. Um, tweeted the um, there's sort of a more nuanced uh, piece on um, Head Start, which really depends on what the kid would be doing otherwise. Right. The truth is, a lot of kids who aren't in Head Start get to go to preschool, uh, other preschools, and so it's probably inappropriate to compare those. So we tweeted it out. Um, the Just first tweet it out so anybody can. What, what's your tweet at handle? I, it, we um, tagged this, oh, okay, and uh, good. yeah, so Everybody people can, can read that. Go. You know, because we don't have time to talk that's, about yeah, it. Well, that's but, really cool. But I, I would say that the impacts of Head Start so have been great understated. When people in the audience are worried about the time, I mean, I, you know, I, I actually uh, like here. I, Look, I, I, I wanted it, to that like, feel, go forth and read. Yeah. Read the HHS's study. Uh, My question is for the billions of dollars per year for the most. At vulnerable populations in this country, mm -hmm. are we getting what we should be getting? The answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. And we need to do better. We owe it to them. So just to close out, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the congressman. Um, what question would you pose? You can have free reign even to leave um, early childhood, but, but what question would you pose to Hillary and Trump Monday night? <laughs> I should have thought of this while I was backstage. <laughs> Well, You're on CNN right now. What? Trump's a huge fan of my moderating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, he basically said, no way, no how that Mary Catherine Hamm has not been good to him. And uh, he would not like her as a I moderator. I think I might ask, actually, uh, the, I think the best way to, to nail him down on actual policy, if you want to, is to ask, who would you listen to on this subject? It's not the sexiest question. Um, but I think Ivanka might be the answer. Mm. I think Mike Pence might be the answer. Mm. And in that case, you know a lot more about what Ivanka thinks, uh, and you can look at Pence's record. But I think that's where he takes his cues uh, and figuring out who in that very, very tight circle right. is the person who has the opinions he listens to on that, mm. I think is the, the way to nail him down, if possible. Hillary, if you were to script a question for Lester Holt, what would, would it be? Um, I guess I. I guess for for Hillary, uh, she, you know, her priority right now is is economic and and um, jobs and and all of the elements of of an economic program that go into that. And she's been very clear that that's her sort of first day, hundred day priority. Um, so I I guess part of it from this perspective would be how does she take her um, decades-long experience on these issues, and that's when I first met her in mm -hmm. 35 years ago was when she was chair of the board of the Children's Defense Fund. Right. Um, how does she take her decades-long experience on these issues and um, execute on them when there are so many other priorities? Um, and, and I think she has given some thought to this and, you know, We'll see, we'll see how much she She's well, actually visiting thank, someplace thank today. Thank you for, for helping me to sketch out and it. provide some scaffolding around the political dimensions of this of this issue of what may be coming next on, on Early Childhood Fund. Thank you very much, Hillary Rosen. Thank, thank you, you very much, very much. Mary Catherine Hamm. Uh, and thank all of you. And now